stroke syndromes are collections of signs and symptoms resulting from strokes in different regions of the brain or central nervous system. In this video, we will cover the stroke syndromes associated with strokes in the territory of the posterior cerebral arteries. They supply the occipital lobe, the inferior surface of the temporal lobes, as well as some deeper structures such as the thalamus and the midbrain of the brainstem. The posterior cerebral arteries arise from the distal end of the basilar artery, which itself is formed from the vertebral arteries. There is a connection with the anterior circulation via the posterior communicating artery. Our first syndrome is alexia without agraphia, which means the inability to read without the loss of writing. Here, the affected regions are the splenium of the corpus callosum and typically the left occipital lobe. The combination of these two areas being affected results in a pure word blindness, meaning that the patient is able to write but is not able to read. Due to the involvement of the left occipital lobe, contralateral homonymous hemianopia may also be present. Next is a similar syndrome the unilateral occipital stroke syndrome. Here, as the name suggests, the occipital lobe on one side is affected, and part of the inferior temporal lobe may also be involved in some instances. The primary finding here is a contralateral homonymous hemianopia, which may often be the only neurological deficit found. We may see macular sparing due to the collateral blood supply to the macular region of the cortex. In some instances, anomia may be present, which is the inability to name. In this case, it's the inability to name colours and objects. Thirdly, we have Anton syndrome, also known as cortical blindness. This occurs where there is an involvement of both occipital lobes, either due to an involvement of both posterior cerebral arteries or due to a lesion at the level of the distal basilar artery. As a result, there is visual loss. However, an interesting feature is that these patients may not be aware of the vision loss or often insist that they are in fact able to see. Balin syndrome is next. This results from lesions in the parieto-occipital lobes on both hemispheres. The findings include oculomotor apraxia, which is a loss of voluntary eye movement where the reflexes remain intact. These patients often therefore have to turn their head to see objects moving in the periphery. Secondly, we have optic ataxia, which is the inability to guide the hand towards an object using visual stimuli, despite having the physical capability of doing so. For example, patients may not be able to grab an item in front of them due to poor hand and eye coordination. This can also manifest itself as dysmetria, which is seen as past pointing when asking the patient to do the finger to nose test. Simultagnosia is the third manifestation, which is the inability to perceive multiple stimuli in the visual field, and therefore these patients end up picking out a single object or single element rather than perceiving everything in front of them. Thalamic pain syndrome is seen when the branches supplying the thalamus are affected. This is also known as degerine rousey syndrome or more recently central post-stroke pain. In this syndrome there is a contralateral pain from the entire affected half of the body which is typically associated with an initial numbness or tingling and then progresses to a debilitating burning pain. Patients may also have allodynia, which is pain caused by a stimulus that doesn't normally cause pain, or hyperalgesia, which is an enhanced sensitivity to pain. Our sixth posterior cerebral artery syndrome is Claude syndrome, which occurs when the midbrain is affected, specifically the tegmentum, making this a brainstem stroke syndrome. Here, we see a contralateral ataxia of the leg and the arm, as well as a potential contralateral weakness of the arm and leg due to involvement of the corticospinal fibres. The other main feature is an ipsilateral oculomotor palsy, which results from injury to the fibres of the oculomotor nerve. 
which is cranial nerve 3. This manifests as ptosis due to the loss of the innervation of the upper eyelid muscles, known as the levator palpebrae superioris, fixed wide pupils, known as midriasis, remember D for dilated, due to the loss of the parasympathetic innervation. We may also see a displacement of the eye inferiorly and laterally, or down and out, due to the superior oblique muscle which is responsible for this movement of the eye being intact while the antagonizing muscles being affected. Due to the loss of the alignment between the eyes, diplopia or double vision is also experienced. The seventh is Weber syndrome, which is another syndrome resulting from injury to the brainstem, more specifically the base of the midbrain. So again, this is a brainstem stroke syndrome. Here, there is a contralateral weakness of the upper and lower limb due to the involvement of the corticospinal tract and ipsilateral third nerve palsy. This sounds very similar to Claude syndrome that we just mentioned, but the difference is that here the base of the midbrain is affected, which is important because there are two main motor nuclei for the oculomotor nerve, which along with their fibres are spread throughout the midbrain. This means that lesions in different locations of the midbrain can generate varying degrees of oculomotor palsy. In this case, it is typically an ipsilateral gaze palsy. In lower midbrain lesions, such as in Weber's syndrome, the extraocular muscles are affected more so than the pupils, which may remain largely intact.